yet. Thanksgiving is this week. Did you all know that? Um, you all are going to be around big tables with lots of food, probably. That uh, aunt and uncle that you haven't seen for a while, they're going to be gathered, and those cousins that you haven't seen for years. You know what I tell you, that uh, there's always that really strange cousin, aunt, or uncle around every table. And if you're going around the table right now and you can't figure out who it is, it's you. It's you. Represent Jesus well. Well, I confess that if I'm going to read a book, I prefer a long book, especially if it's a novel or a biography. I mean, if you're going to invest in in understanding a character and really appreciating the way that the story is going, you know, a 12-page book isn't going to do it for me. I, I want to invest in a long book. It might take me a long time to read it, but I enjoy a good long story, especially if it's reading, if it's written really well. One of my pet peeves is to begin reading a really good story, and once I get connected to the characters and the plot, all of a sudden it's done. I, I just don't like that. We have been reading a really, really, really good book over the last 31 weeks, haven't we? It's called the Bible. And uh, many of us have been reading a, a book called The Story because what it did was it took uh, many passages and put them together, and for 31 weeks, we just begin to march through the Old Testament and then the New Testament, and uh, we, we really got a good synopsis of the whole story. We were introduced to the primary storyline early in the story, and I can tell you it ended, it is the same storyline at the end. God desires to have a warm God desires to have warm fellowship with us just as he intended from the very beginning. It never changed throughout all of the Old Testament and New Testament, and it remains the same even today. We saw his desire for fellowship from the very beginning. As God created Adam and Eve, he had fellowship in the cool of the day. I love that verse. He had fellowship in the cool of the day with him. Unfortunately, Adam and Eve broke that fellowship because they decided to serve themselves instead of God, and they were forced out of the garden, therefore out of God's presence and out of fellowship with God. Sin entered the world. They had to work. They had to deal with dirt. They had to, they had to provide their own food. They had to do all of the things that we all now know as every day for us. We saw God's desire for fellowship when God made a covenant with Abraham that his descendants would be blessed and that they would mirror the holiness of God so that the, uh, those in other countries would see who God really was and that they would realize that God wants a relationship with them too. It wasn't just about Jews having a special relationship with God. They were to mirror that holiness to other communities, other languages, other people groups, so that they would have a relationship with God. He wanted to have fellowship with them as well. We saw God's desire for fellowship when he sheltered the Israelites from a destructive drought, even though they were considered slaves of Egypt during that time. Even then, God was creating a fellowship with them, a relationship. We saw God's desire for fellowship when God led the, his people to freedom through the leadership of Moses and led them to a land that God had dedicated specifically for them. They called it the promised land or Israel. We saw God's desire for fellowship when he had a tabernacle and then later on a temple built. It was designed by God himself to bring the Israelites into fellowship with him. They, God wanted them to be in his presence and he said, come to the tabernacle, come to the temple and we can be in fellowship here 
And the only way that we can be in fellowship is, is through worship and sacrifice. So God made a way for the people to be in relationship with him, even with the tabernacle and temple. The death of a lamb, the confession of sin, by faith would provide fellowship with God and man. But the people of Israel once again desired their own way. They chose to serve a king instead of serving God. Unfortunately, their kings did not serve the creator often and led them in sin. And finally, to destruction. Solomon's temple, which represented God's presence in Israel, was destroyed. Even during their divided kingdom, and finally in present imprisonment, God still showed his desire for fellowship by sending them prophet after prophet who spoke some really hard truth to them. Spoke to them often about how they could, even in these very difficult days, come back into fellowship with him. There were Jeremiah and Israel, or Isaiah and Ezekiel. They called out to the broken people of Israel that God still wanted to love them. He still wanted to be in relationship with them. And finally, some of the tribes limped back to Jerusalem under the leadership of Ezra and Nehemiah. There was a lengthy time of silence from God. Scripture says it was around 400 years. During that time of 400 years, no prophets spoke, no miracles occurred, no angels showed up. It was silent from God, silence from God. A time would come, though, that after those 400 years of silence, the, Is the, the Israelites became extremely hungry for the presence and the voice of God. And a time would come just as he promised when God would provide a Messiah for his creation. Jesus would live with them. He would suffer the temptation and the trials that they dealt with every single day. Their Messiah would do what no sacrificial lamb could ever do. Jesus, the Son of God, the pure Lamb of God, took their sins upon himself, past, present, and future, and died once for all on a very cruel cross. He paid the penalty for their sin. His death and his resurrection brought them back into fellowship with God once again if they by faith accepted him as their personal savior. The new church of believers began to explode under the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Peter became an amazing evangelist and a church planter. Paul became the church's new primary theologian and letter writer, leaving instructions to the new church of what was important and how they could come back into fellowship with God once again. And the new church became witnesses to the fellowship that God desired in Jerusalem, and they moved into Judea, and then they moved into Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth. Well, the final book in the Bible is called Revelation. It's called this because it reveals how life on earth as we know it will end. It could just as easily be called the new beginning, though, because it is all about what life in God's perfect community will be like. And the book may mark the end of the Bible story, but it's really the beginning of a brand new adventure for those of us who have fellowship with God. So in honor of reading God's word, would you please stand?
And I'm going to be reading Revelation 1, 9 through 19. My friends, I'm about to read to you God's word. It's inspired. It has authority. It is without error. And if you'll read it and apply it, it will radically change your life. Hear the word of the Lord. I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and, and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. On the Lord's day, I was in the spirit and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet which said, write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I heard and I saw seven golden lampstands, and among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet and with a golden sash around his chest. The hair on his head was, like, was white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand, he had seven stars, and coming out of his mouth was a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead. And now look, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. Write, therefore, what you have seen, what is now and what will take place later. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. You probably knew that the author of the book of Revelation is John. He authored several letters and uh, gospels. Or, well, the gospel of John was his only gospel. And then he wrote uh, John 1, 2, and 3. And now he's written the last book, Revelation. I just want to mention, uh, last week I mistakenly uh, said that John was Jesus' half-brother. I meant Jude. I corrected myself later, but because many of you probably didn't get your Nazarene nap because that was just an explosion in your brain, I'm sorry. John is not the brother of Jesus, maybe the best friend of Jesus, but he wasn't the half-brother. It was Jude. He was one of Jesus's original 12 disciples. He was known as the disciple whom Jesus loved, so he was considered one of Jesus' best friends. At the Lord's Supper, that last supper, John sat next to Jesus and leaned on Jesus. He is the one who was so excited about the empty tomb that he outran Peter. John wrote Revelation, though, as a really old prisoner. When he wrote this, John probably couldn't run quite as fast anymore. He was now an old man. He was probably in his 80s or 90s. He wrote probably around 95 to 96 AD. So this was the last book in our New Testament that was written. So he, he had all of almost 100 years 60 years or so after the death of Christ, just to kind of wrestle with what had gone on. And, and as he would wrestle with what Jesus said and then how the church was ex exploding, now he has this very mature understanding of the church as he wrote this book. Historians tell us that he was the only apostle who was not killed for professing his faith to Jesus in, in Jesus Christ. Instead, he was banished 
on an island called Patmos to spend his last days completely isolated and surrounded by water. Now, you probably know the Patmos is an island just off the coast of Greece. It's not very large. It's just about, it's a really skinny island uh, full of rocks. It gets about 800 uh, feet high, so there's a little uh, ridge in the middle of it, and it's only about 10 miles long. The religious leaders thought his ability to do further damage would be controlled if they just kept him away from everyone. Boy, did they miscalculate. It's on this island that God visits John in a, in a vision and gives him just a clear understanding of what is to come, including the best picture that we have throughout all of the New Testament about who God is and what the kingdom is going to look like after life on earth is done. It's called revelation because it was a revelation of what the future held for, our, for the church, us. And it sparked great hope in believers throughout all generations as we all have read Revelation. And it keeps the church going in the darkest times. And it gives hope for those of us who have lost parents or children knowing what is going on in heaven right now. We read in, in the New Testament, specifically in the book of Revelation, about what heaven looks like. Regardless of how difficult our lives are now, the book of Revelation tells us that we will retire one day in God's perfect community, which is exactly what God intended for us in the first place, right? What was the plot in all of the Old and New Testament? That God desires to be in community with us. He desires to have fellowship with us. The book of Revelation says, we get to end that way in the very presence of God, in the cool of the day, just like Adam and Eve. Praise be to the Lord. The purpose of the book of Revelation was to reveal the person of Jesus and his power and his plan for the future. In one one, it said, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must take place soon. There are two things that the book of Revelation was intent on sharing with the church. The first is the revelation reveals what our future will hold. Can I take a guess that the book of Revelation has caused both confusion and maybe even excitement to most of us here? If I had you raise your hand... I would be raising my hand saying there's some really confusing things in Revelation when I've read it. There's some head scratchers. I was, you know, there's times that I read and I'm like, Lord, you're just going to have to help me here. Help me read by faith. I don't quite understand what this means. Revelation is considered apocalyptic literature, which means it, it, it apocalyptic means to reveal or to unveil, right? It, it deals with futuristic prophecy. It focuses on the, the cataclysmic, the, the worldwide events. It uses bigger than life symbols and illustrations. That's what apocalyptic material looks like. Apocalyptic literature is found in Revelation and a few chapters in Daniel. It contains the presence of strange visions, cer uh, certainly ghastly figures. We, we hear John talking about dragons and prostitutes and creatures with multiple eyes. You don't want to read that right before bed, certainly to our little kids, right? Uh, at least we need to be able to explain it. But there are, there are some images in this, this revelation that, that are just otherworldly to us. It can, they contain bigger than life symbols and images like mountains thrown into the sea and dragons and, and horrible beasts. It contains events that signal the end of the world. 
it reveals how the world as we know it will end. Now, unfortunately, unsavory TV preachers and authors have made a whole lot of money by establishing dates. The exact process, the exact history, one, two, three, here's a date, here's a date, and then they sell a, good, a, a book for a good profit. If you hear that, if you hear someone saying, it'll be exactly this year, and this is exactly how it'll happen, turn the TV off. That's probably the best. Don't buy that book. Why? Well, I can tell you, I don't spend a lot of time trying to decipher the end times because I'm confident that God will bring about the end time in his own time, whether I understand it or not. In fact, the scripture is quite clear. Jesus even said, I don't know, you shouldn't know, don't worry about it. God's got this. God is the only one who knows. I have two responsibilities. You do too. Be prepared. I have to make sure I'm ready for that time. And the second thing that I'm focused on is take as many people to heaven as I can. Me being prepared and me preparing others, that's my goal. Recently, I, I heard a preacher say that he has no time to be on the planning committee of the coming of Christ. He said, the scripture says that no person knows the day or the hour, yet there are so many people trying to identify the prophecies and count the years and estimate the coming of Jesus. It's just exhausting. But he said, I don't want to be on the planning committee of the coming Jesus. I want to be on the welcoming committee of Jesus. That's me too. I want to ready as many people as I can to welcome Jesus back, to always be looking forward to when he is coming, not to ever forget it, but to point people to the coming of Jesus. I want to ensure that I am ready to be in the presence of Jesus at all times. There are several things that the scripture is clear about, about the end, the, the, concerning the end of the world. There's lots of things that we don't know. There are a few things that we are very clear on. The first is this. Jesus will come back to gather those left on earth. That's a promise. Jesus will come back. When we start Advent season next week, can you believe that? We will have our Advent candles up front. We'll do Advent readings and light candles. Every time we do Advent, we're looking at two things. Advent means coming. So we are, we are looking back at the first coming of Jesus but we are also looking at the second advent of Jesus. Jesus promises he will come back. And whether it's before his reign or during his reign or after, we're not, we're not confident. And after Jesus ascended into heaven, the angels declared to the prophets, men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky, this same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way, in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. And Paul describes the events to the believers in Thessalonica. He said, for the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with a voice of the arch archangel and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them, with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. So we will be gathered with all those who have gone before. That will be exciting. There's another thing that we're confident of. For, one, for Christ will reign on earth as king of kings for a thousand years. He will sit on David's throne. He will rule in peace, but with an iron rod this time. 
We also know that at the end of the thousand years, Satan will be released, defeated again, and then cast into the lake of fire. And I can tell you there's a lot of questions going on in my mind about what this will look like and how it will happen and where will I be at the same I, So I can tell you I have a lot of questions, and my guess is you do too. But I'm trusting Jesus. There will be a final judgment by God. We know this to be true. Those who have claimed Jesus as Lord will be judged according to our works. Did you know it's not just those who have not accepted Christ that will be judged, but we will be judged for how we, how we ministered, how we use the resources and the gifts that God has given to us. Those who have not accepted Christ will be judged as well and sent to the lake of fire that is often called hell. God has given multiple warnings. He's desired fellowship. He's done his best to bring people back into relationship with Jesus, back into relationship with him. But those who do not accept his forgiveness, they will bear the punishment of eternity without the presence of God. We also know in Revelation that this world will be destroyed. 2 Peter 3.10, the heavens will disappear with a roar, the elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. The heavens here refers to this physical, uh, this physical universe, the, the stars and the planets and the galaxies. They'll all be consumed by some type of tremendous explosion that will consume all matter as we know it. That is so big, that is so out of our normal context. I don't even understand how to wrestle with that. We also know that God will create a new heaven and a new earth. It's going to be called the New Jerusalem. It's going to be the capital city of heaven, a place of perfect holiness. So Revelation reveals what our future will hold, but it also reveals what heaven will, be look, will look like. It talks about how the earth will end, but how heaven will look and what our eternity will look like. Some, thinks, think, some authors paint pictures of, of us sitting on clouds, playing the harp, half naked, We've all seen those little cartoons of, of, of little angels playing harps, and some thinks we're gonna think that we're gonna become angels. Not true. Some speak of heaven as boring and no fun. Not true. We know very little about heaven, but let me tell you, there are some things that are very clear. The first is that it will be a place of unimaginable beauty. John tried to use his human words to describe what he saw in Revelation chapter 21. And those of us who have lost loved ones, spouses or parents or children, we've gone to these passages just to make ourselves feel better because we know what our loved ones are seeing and doing. He said the material of the wall was jasper and the city was pure gold like clear glass. The foundation stones of the city wall were adorned with all, every kind of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third chalcedony, the, the fourth emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth sardius, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysoprase, the 11th, Jacinth, the 12th, Amethysts. Can somebody just say, wow, pastor, that was amazing. You actually, can I just tell you, I made up half of those pronunciations. I've told you before, if you don't know how to pronounce something, say it boldly with a backbone and people go, wow, he knows what he's saying. But these stones were all colored jewels. If you'll look up each one of these, you'll see that some were 
various colors of green. There was sky blue. There was kind of a golden red, violet, and other radiant colors. So you've got these a found foundation made of 12 different levels of different colors of, of amazing, beautiful jewels. There was a glass-like gold and trans, translucent walls. There were huge gates that were made out of, of one pearl. It was truly an unbelievable, indescribable beauty by John. I'm sure he just reveled in that beauty as he sat in that cave probably where he was writing his book. Heaven is a beauty, is a place where death is fully conquered. 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says, the last enemy to be destroyed is death. And throughout Revelation, we're given a list of the no mores. In heaven, there's going to be no more pain and no more sorrow and no more crying. You can amen anytime when you're tired of these. There's going to be no more sickness, no more hunger, no more trouble or tragedy. Absolute joy and eternal blessings, it is hard for our minds to even grasp such a pain-free, sorrow-free, crying-free, sickness-free, hunger-free, trouble-free, tragedy-filled, uh, free place. There's no more curse of sin. John said there will be no more, there will no longer be any curse, and the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it. And his bondservants will serve him. The curse will be overturned and erased forever with all its detestable ramifications. Agony of toil and sweat and thorns and disease and sorrow and sin will have absolutely no place in heaven. And the church says, Amen. Hallelujah. Paul says, I has not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. Well, then there has to be the question asked, how can I make for sure that I can go there, that I can be in God's presence, that I can enjoy that presence, that I uh, enjoy God's uh, presence? How can I Enjoy the beauty and all of the no mores. Well, can I just tell you that heaven is designed for all believers? John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world. He didn't say, For God so loved the good people. He didn't say, God so loved the people on this side of the train tracks. God didn't say, for God so loved just the Americans. He says, for God so loved the world. He did not say that he only knocks on certain hearts' doors. He invites all of us. We also know that only those who have accepted Christ's gift of salvation would be allowed in heaven. He's invited everyone but only very specific people could come because of a decision that they made. It's those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. They've truly repented of their sins. They have believed in Jesus Christ as their only way to salvation. Only those will get to have to be in the presence of Jesus. Those who practice sin will not be allowed to enjoy heaven. Revelation 21, 27 says, nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. And he continues, he said, outside are the dogs, 
those who practice magic arts, the, uh, the sexually Im immoral, the murderers, the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. There will be people who know how to say the right things. They've read the Bible. In fact, they've even sat in churches, congregations just like this who still will not be able to go to heaven because they have not yet accepted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. The most important part about going to heaven is that we will see the face of our Father. We will see the intense love in his eyes. We will finally understand the great extent in which he went to get us back. We will understand that storyline that he did uh, everything possible. He sent people to us. He spoke truth. He protected us. Maybe he even allowed us to walk through the valley of Baca so that we could come back into fellowship with us. It will overwhelm us every day for eternity, and it will compel us to worship him when we realize the extent that he went to bring us back into fellowship with him. We will join the angels, and we will cry and sing, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. And we will know that we are finally home. It will be the ultimate home that we always yearn for, a place of rest and joy and peace and comfort and life and love, a home of wholeness, of completion with our Savior, of the Father who loves us relentlessly. The fact is, from the very beginning of the creation story that we talked about 31 weeks ago, God desired to be in community with his children. Our lower story has finally intersected with God's upper story. For eternity, the creator will finally enjoy fellowship with his creation. Would you please stand? If you are a follower of Jesus today, no matter how difficult your life has become, no matter how dark your pathway, no matter how intense your weariness, take courage. Because your lower story doesn't end there. Because you believed in Jesus, your story has just begun and your future will be phenomenal. Plus, you have a guaranteed role in the upper story now where you will now live forever with God. Wow, what an amazing future we have for those of us who have accepted Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. If you haven't yet responded to the call of God to follow Jesus, you could miss out on all that God has prepared for you, both here on earth, but more importantly, that God has prepared a perfect community where you can have fellowship with God for eternity. He's prepared that for you. It will be an ex 
it will be extremely unfortunate for you to miss out on that promise of heaven because you have not yet made the decision to follow Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. And as your pastor, I need you to know that if you do not make a decision to follow Jesus, you will spend eternity in hell. And I don't say that with joy, but I speak the truth. If you have followed along in this story, you will know that no amount of working will give you salvation. There's no list of rules long enough if you follow them that will get you back to God. It's been tried before and it doesn't work. So let me ask you a question. Aren't you tired of working so hard? Especially because you know deep down inside it's never worked before and it's not going to work in the future. That's got to be exhausting. You ask another question, don't you want to finally come into fellowship with God and stop running because it's exhausting. It's exhausting to run and try and ask questions all by yourself. I'm going to do something that I believe is really important for taking a step into relationship with Christ. I'm going to ask that while we sing this song, if you have not yet accepted Christ as your Savior and you desire to be in fellowship with Him, that you not stay at your seat, but you come to the altar. And I'm going to tell you why. Historically, the altar has been a place where people make significant decisions. It's a, play, it's a public place that represents, in the Old Testament, a place of death. That's where the word altar comes from, place of death. And that's exactly what Christ is inviting us to do, publicly making a decision that I'm tired of living for myself and I'm dying out to my old self and I'm inviting new life that only Christ can give. And I can't think of a better reason to come to these altars than to make a decision for your eternity, not just for tomorrow, but for eternity. No one's going to force you. It's only a decision that you can make. We can't make it for you. You must make a decision to follow Jesus completely. I'm not going to force you. I'm not going to sing 18 verses I'm just going to say, friends, Jesus desires, God desires to have fellowship with you. And he's done everything possible to share the truth with you, to invite you into his presence, and to prepare a place for eternity where he can be in fellowship with you. But the decision is yours. If you would like to come into fellowship with Jesus today and your life be radically changed, as we sing this chorus, I'd like, I'd like to invite you to come to the altar and I will meet you here and I'll pray for you that you accept Christ as your personal Savior and your eternity will be different. Please come as we sing. Turn your eyes.
Heavenly Father, we are so very thankful that you love us so much that you do anything possible to bring us into relationship with you. And Father, we are so very thankful that those of us in this congregation have made a decision to follow you completely. You have forgiven us and you have cleansed us from unrighteousness. You have credited us righteousness through the act of your son dying on the cross, taking our sins upon him and dying, the pure lamb of God being sacrificed for our sin. You went beyond what we could even imagine that we might come into fellowship with you and we're so very thankful. And now, Father, as we look forward to the future, some things will happen that we will not understand. The timing we will not understand. We won't be prepared. We will have a lot of questions, but here's what we do know. You will come back, and you will gather those of us who've accepted you. And Father, we stand ready we stand waiting to be used of you. We want to be used of you to prepare others, to invite others into relationship with you so that they can be ready and that they would be able to spend eternity in heaven, a beautiful place in your presence. We love you, Father. And we commit our lives to you that we continue this story of bringing people into fellowship with you. And we ask these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Would you receive this benediction? Let the words of Jesus himself be our benediction. Even the last words written in the book of Revelation. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this testimony for the churches. I am the root and offspring of David, the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride say, come, and let him who hears say, come. Whoever is thirsty, let him come. And whoever wishes, let him take the free gift of the water of life. He who testifies to these things says, Yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's people. Amen. Now, in the name of the Father, 
and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go in peace, for he's already gone before you. You're dismissed.